Hey, what's going on, everybody? It is Aaron Trevino here. We have another wonderful guest from Orange County, California. We have Kevin. How you doing, Kevin? I'm doing well for yourself. I can't complain. It's it's been a uh, it's been a good day, and the weather's a lot better than last week here in Austin. I heard. I heard. That's great. That's great. Thank you for having me on. Thank you very much, very much for having us uh, on the show today. Sure thing, Kevin. It's definitely a pleasure to have you on. Um, you know, so for those of us who aren't too familiar with you, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Kevin Kim. I'm a partner at Jirasi LLP. Uh, we're a very, very uh, specialized law firm focused almost exclusively in private lending uh, for real estate. Uh, we are a nationwide law firm. We uh, have clients in all 50 states, even some abroad. And we're really hyper-focused. Uh, I manage the firm's corporate and securities division. So my area of expertise is all things capital related, all things corporate law, all things uh, you know, uh, about raising money, right? So I'm a securities attorney at heart. And then um, we also have our largest department is our banking and finance division, which is purely transactional focused, loan documentation, uh, transactional support, uh, nationwide compliance, private lenders. And then we have our, uh, our, our, uh, our banking and uh, our, our litigation and bankruptcy team. And, uh, you know, they're very much uh, long time, strong experts in creditors' rights, bankruptcy defense, uh, title claims, and we also do foreclosure uh, for our clients. So we're really built to serve a private lender's business up and down the uh, uh, business from start to finish. So, you know, we've been uh, involved in private lending. I've been involved in private lending for about 10 years now. Uh, the law firm has been uh, as well. Uh, we're really, really entrenched in the space as well. So we're, you know, we help found the trade association. Uh, we got, we have a, you know, we, we try to be a value provider beyond legal services. And uh, yeah, our, our, our core uh, mission is to provide uh, peace of mind to the private lending industry uh, nationwide. Sure thing, absolutely, Kevin. You know, it's great that you're not only serving just in Orange County or California, you know, you're all over the country, right? Sure, yes, sir. We have yeah. more clients out of, out of California than we do in, so. Yeah, fair enough. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm curious as well, you know, maybe for those of us who aren't familiar with it, you said you're a securities attorney at heart, you know, could you mm -hmm. uh, kind of explain for us, you know, what a security is and, and what it means in this context? Yeah, so in the real estate, private lending context, at the end of the day, if you're taking an investment, right, if you're accepting cap, uh, capital from a investor, you have to ask yourself, does this trigger securities laws, right? A security can be anything. It can be I mean, the obvious, the obvious is a stock or a bond, right? But LLC interests, LP interests, pretty obvious. But there are instances where, you know, even a lease can become a security. And so really it's, it's it, the question you have to ask yourself is, does the nature of the, of the transaction constitute an investment? And if it's an investment, okay, well, then it probably is a security. Uh, and to, to ensure that we're being compliant, we probably should run it by a security store like myself. So we, we work with all types of clients of all sizes, you know, and I, I take that call all the time. Well, is this really a security transaction, security transactions? Now, nine times out of 10, it is um, because we're pretty conservative. We don't want to be on the wrong side of the SEC on this issue. So, so nine times out of 10, it is. And it's really just a question of making sure that we stay in conformity with the law, usually an exemption and uh, avoid any kind of registration if we can avoid it. So. Okay, and you also use the, the word uh, exemption. Can you kind of uh, explain what, what that would mean in this context? Yeah, I mean, so in, in, in most transactions for real estate professionals and private lenders, you're dealing with um, people that don't necessarily want to go and register with the SEC or the state, right? So registration meaning that you are, you are registering the security to be sold to the public, right? So large and heavy endeavor. Uh, we see a lot of those IPOs out there. That's what it is, right? So to avoid that, there are a handful of, of exemptions at the federal and state level that we typically will look to to see if uh, we can avoid registration and uh, still offer and sell securities to investors and raise money, right? And for example, the big one that we, we use a lot is Regulation D. Uh, it's a uh, national exemption. It's a federal exemption. It preempts state law. It covers the entire country. And uh, the key to that exemption, there's two exemptions underneath that umbrella exemption. And the key there is basically who you're selling securities to, right? Uh, and how you're, how you're selling those securities. A lot of the laws in the country mirror this regulation. And the, the key here is to use 
to, to sell securities to uh, high net worth investors, right? Because the SEC is really concerned about, um, you know, consumers being defrauded in their investments, right? So uh, we want to focus on high net worth accredited investors. And uh, the regulations also have to do a lot with, um, you know, advertising, right? And so uh, we don't, you know, there are two regulations that are commonly used under the umbrella regulation B. Uh, one permits you to advertise and, and solicit investors publicly and one says you cannot. So it really depends on what your model is going to be. And so, you know, this regulation, regulation D is heavily relied upon in real estate and in private lending and, and in general, right? Private equity, startups, venture capital, you know, across, across the spectrum. And, it, and, it, and it's very powerful because, you know, it, 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 it allows us to raise significant sums of cash without having to go out and register and, or, go public, or, or go public. So this is this is the kind of this, these, these transactions are our bread and butter. We do this for both developers and lenders across the United States, and uh, you know we've both formed you know vehicles and funds to take advantage of the exemption, but also defended cases against regulators uh, you know for violations of the exemption. Sure, absolutely, Kevin. You know, so you talked about how you know you're working all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, you you kind of have a you know a flexible approach where you can do a, a few different things. Yeah. You mentioned how you're working with private lenders and developers. Mm -hmm. Is there any sweet spot in terms of, um, you know, maybe a size of a company or a, per, a particular deal that you're working with? For us, not necessarily. I mean, for us, if they're a private lender, we really pride ourselves on being able to work from formation to institutional, right? So we can work with a brand new lending operation. They're, you know, they're a loan origination that, you know, or an investor started up by themselves or with a team and they want to get started, build a business, get the licenses, offer, offer securities, raise money. That's, you know, we're happy to work with all of that. And that's where, you know, I shine is where on my side of the house and the corporate security side, starting these businesses and getting them set up properly is where, you know, where I built my uh, reputation. And then of course, along the spectrum, right? So we work with clients that manage hundreds of millions of dollars, up to billions of dollars in, uh, in origination and so on and so forth. So, there's no real sweet spot for me. I would say what really defines our sweet spot is, is the is the type of client that we're looking to work for, right? And and that means someone who's really taking their 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 business seriously, um, is not not interested in cutting corners, and uh, wants to be on the right wants to be on the uh, wants to be doing their transactions in conformity with with the legal requirements they're supposed to be doing, and not necessarily you know using. The, the 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 easy options out there that may not necessarily be compliant so sure sure absolutely kevin um so you you know you've kind of thrown around a few terms maybe like private equity or, or private lending you work primarily with private lenders um is is it the same thing or you know what what exactly is a, a private lender sure i mean so private lending is a very very broad concept but in the con in the context that i'm using it it's really focused in real estate um our clients uh, the industry of private lending is, in, in the context that I've defined, is really, uh, was really kind of created out of uh, a necessity, right? And so as banks began to tighten uh, uh, risk tolerances and underwriting, and uh, they're notoriously slow, uh, private investors and organizations started to take advantage of that. And that industry has now expanded and expanded and expanded to several trillion dollars worth. And <clears throat> ultimately, it boils down to uh, you know, lenders who, who are not, not banks, not financial institutions, uh, typically speaking, uh, not any kind of depository institution. And they're making uh, real estate loans, uh, typically at a faster pace, right? Looking, you know, a lot of times uh, they're valuing the uh, asset more than the borrower. And uh, they're, they're focused on, a lot of them at least are focused on short-term uh, bridge lending. And then a lot of our clients are now shifting into more permanent lending, especially with the DS, DSCR, SFR rental loans. But it's still a very much um, service oriented business in the sense that there's a lot of need out there for faster transactions, um, you know, maybe a little bit more leverage, and then also, uh, you know, asset driven lending. And so that is the industry that we serve, right? And so most of our clients, it was a 90% of our clients are non-bank lenders, alternative lenders. And then uh, we got a handful of credit unions and banks that we work with as well. But the core concept is that they're still trying to create a, uh, 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 they're still trying to make these commercial or residential loans that are 
that are uh, faster uh, to close, you know, a little bit more higher leverage, uh, and uh, a little bit more asset driven in the underwriting. So, yeah, absolutely, Kevin. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I can see it firsthand how how big the, the demand is for that private money. You know, given mm -hmm. that, that that's uh, that's what I do, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we, we see quite a few deals in the different Texas metros and at least here in Texas, it, it's crucial to be able to, to close quickly in a fast market. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And that's, and that's what drives it, right? You know, a bank's going to take months to underwrite you and approve you, even for the simplest of loans. And so that shouldn't be that way. And that's what allows, I feel like it has allowed the private lending industry to thrive. There's so much opportunity thanks to that inefficiency. So. Sure. You know, I'm curious as well, you know, when, when people talk about financing, maybe financing their deals, it kind of seems like this private lending space that you're talking about, it's generally not at top of mind for people. People just nope. think they would go to the bank down the street. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? I think it's totally under misunderstood uh, for two reasons. Number one, you know, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a pretty big industry from my perspective, but if you think about it, you know, if you look at the larger scheme of things, right, in all types of real estate financing, the large players are all banks, right, and or some type of financial institution. So I think what what is just the nature of you know uh, market share and, and marketing. But once you start getting into the asset classes that these lenders serve, like for example, once you start flipping houses, you start to really know who these people are, right, and know this industry, get to know this industry very well. So I think if you if you are an investor or you're a developer who works in real estate actively as a profession, it's a pretty well-known space and pretty well-known, uh, you know, industry. But if you're just a regular old, you know, home buyer, you know, it's not, well, first of all, it's not necessary for you, right? It's not, you don't need it. If you're doing a 20% down conventional mortgage, it's not something you're going to go to. It's not something that's conducive to what you're looking for either. Um, but I feel now with, with a lot of the digital marketing, you know, it's become pretty well accepted, even for the investors that are investing in like, you know, rental homes. Um, so it's become a lot more, uh, well, well received, but if you look at it from the larger populace, like right, this is a good example is, you know, uh, you know, we went to Washington DC with, uh, our trade, uh, the trade association that were part of American association of private lenders. We were shocked to find out that, you know, um, you know, a lot of the Congress people that we had spoke to and their staff equated this industry to subprime mortgages. They were very, very, pro they had no idea. And so that that's also part of it is that like a lot of people think that we're like either loan sharks or we're we're in in some kind of subprime lending operation. When in reality, 99% of my clients are doing commercial purpose transactions, just so happen to be secured by re residential real estate, right? So they're flipping houses, they're renting houses, they're they're building apartments, they're you know they're, they're doing value add to multifamily, whatever that is. But ultimately, it boils down to a a business. Uh, you know, a going concern. It's not for someone's primary residence, right? We're not dealing with consumers. We're not putting, you know, grandma on the street if we foreclose, right? And so um, I think there's that disconnect even in Washington and, and, and also in our local capitals uh, at the government level. And that needs to be addressed. And we're working hard with our, you know, with AAPL's government relations committee to make sure that we educate the public on this issue and uh, show, show the world that what we're doing to, to create, you know, more housing inventory, uh, updated housing inventory, and also affordable housing. So, sure, you know, it is interesting, Kevin, kind of seeing the, I guess, the the public um, perception of things, right? You know, because even if you say the words real estate, people assume, oh, you're you're buying or selling grandma's house, right? Uh, you don't normally, you know, someone wouldn't think about private lending, think about legalities, think about securities, right? No, no, not at all. Not at all. And, and it's funny because at the Wall Street level, it's very well understood, right? It's this, it's just the, you know, you know, Joe Sixpack, you know, and, you know, Congress, they just don't understand it because it's not that big and it's not very heavily regulated, right? And, and then the last component of this is that it, it, it's because it's not heavily regulated, there hasn't been that much political activity behind it, not a lot of press behind it, right? And so, um, whereas, you know, the only thing that's remotely related to someone who's completely uninitiated or, or, or ignorant to the world, this industry, is going to equate it to subprime mortgages from 08, right? And that's a huge difference there, right? And so, but, you know, I, I feel like the industry is growing and, uh, you know, a lot more people are investing in residential real estate and in just real estate in general. 
And, um, you know, house flipping has become a very, it's become kind of a, you know, cult phenomenon. You know, you, just, you see all those TV shows about flipping houses now. So I don't think that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, you know, a um, uh, unknown world anymore. But I do think that, you know, we do need to put, create more awareness around what we're doing for the world, what we're doing for the real estate industry as a whole, and what we're doing to create more opportunity uh, for new home buyers and, and, uh, and affordable housing as well. So. Sure, absolutely, Kevin. I'm curious as well, you know, kind of when you were having these, uh, you know, these conversations with these elected officials, you're talking about the, the word awareness, you know, what, what does that awareness look like? Is that through legislation or, or what does that look like? I mean, legislation is part of it, but the, the, the nice part about private lending is that it's all commercial purpose. Majority of it is, right? There, there is the consumer sector, and that's a different conversation. But, you know, the, initial, the primary group that we serve are business purpose lenders uh, for either commercial real estate or residential real estate. It's not heavily regulated, right? And so we want, and we want to keep it that way, right? And we do not want to be overly regulated like the consumer, you know, the non-QM lenders or the conventional mortgage lenders out there. So we want to keep things on a less regulated, and that allows us to kind of avoid any, and if we see legislation come up, it's typically related to licensing. Hey, you need to be licensed to do what you're doing, right? Or some kind of tax. And so we, there is some legislative activity to oppose that. It's normally at a local level. There is some federal legislation that, that kind of creeps its way into our world, like Humda, right? It has to do with construction lending, right? But a, a majority of it really doesn't. The, what the one thing we're, we're trying to do is, is actually from a data standpoint, present to the to, to the Congress people out there is that listen, in your districts, in, in your amongst your constituents, one of the complaints is that there's no affordable housing, there's no housing stock in general. Well, these people are, especially on the fix and flip side, they're taking dilapidated older inventory and improving them and then putting them back on the market. That's you couldn't ask for more, right? It's way better than having to build master plans and having to deal with zoning and, and permit issues and new bonds and that kind of stuff. But, but it's also being done by small businesses. So it, it, a, lot of it has to, a lot of it has to do with that. I think the awareness associated with what it's doing to stimulate the local economy. But also, like, I think what they're, what they're not understanding uh, has to do with, they're worried about public perception, right? So they're worried that we're putting grandma out in the street. So that also has to do with it, right? We have to demonstrate from a foreclosure standpoint, what is what does the foreclosure process look like in this in this space? How does it work, you know, as it pertains to a, a consumer mortgage? And who is the borrower? What are the what are the foreclosure rates in our space? All these things, how does that impact the local economy? How does that look like from a perception standpoint? Um, and also presenting data about how much inventory we're producing, right? There's significant inventory being produced by these flippers out there, but that's not being promoted, I guess you can call it, right? We're not promoting that enough, you know, and um, being able to take a, you know, 1940s lot, improve it and put it back out there for sale, something, something you, you know, something that's invaluable when, when housing inventory is at rock bottom, right? So, you know, that's, uh, I think that kind of information, that kind of data needs to be put out there. Um, and also, I think it also has to do with capital and Wall Street, right? At the end of the day, money talks. And, a lot of these politicians pay attention to Wall Street. What's interesting is, is that Wall Street loves this industry, but doesn't make it known to the public, right? We randomly will see certain industry professionals on a Bloomberg show or, you know, some type of MSNBC money show or something like that. That needs to happen more, right? And we need to get it out, get more information out there about why this is a great industry. So. Sure, absolutely. And it kind of seems like that, that message can apply to a lot of different markets, you know, given that there's so many markets, like you said, in, in a housing shortage. Right. I mean, fixing, I've just been concentrating on fix and flip, but also residential rentals. I mean, rentals are a huge investment opportunity and it's being taken advantage of across the country. They're, they're, you know, YouTube personalities that built their fortunes doing this. Right. And so it's becoming much more mainstream. And I think from that perspective, you know, showing, showing that also, because it creates a means for people to actually, you know, find a place to live. And that's, that's important, right? And, and multifamily is one aspect of that, but, you know, SFR rentals are another aspect of that. So making sure that we, under, we, we, we demonstrate we're putting out there, you know, we're putting out inventory, both from a rental standpoint and from a, uh, uh, you know, purpose standpoint. And we're contributing to, we're contributing to the economy. 
as opposed to some kind of loan shark operator, predatory lending operation, you know what I mean? So. Sure, absolutely. No, it's, it's great to kind of make that distinction, um, you know, especially if there's any sort of negative connotation with a particular industry and it's great to clear the air and, and hear this perspective. Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it's interesting kind of, you know, talking about, um, you know, not only the, the different housing markets, you know, that you can uh, focus on flips and new construction as well. Um, you know, what do you think of, of the, the housing shortage that we have right now? I mean, what's kind of the, do you foresee there being any sort of solution in the near future? I think that we need to really revisit the idea of zoning. And you guys in Texas have the best zoning laws in the country, right? But we don't here in California. Although the ADU boom here in California is not scoff at, but it's growing like crazy. But we really need to take a look at zoning and we really need to make it, make it easier to build houses. Um, it's very hard to build houses such that only Toll Brothers, Lennox, Lennar, Lennar, and these kind of companies are building houses here in California. So like, and, and a grand scale, right? Affordable housing being the point. The other issue is inventory. I mean, really inventory as an issue, right? There's just not enough inventory. Um, and then the last issue is really the question of affordability. And I think affordability meaning like, why are values so inflated? And this is, I've been having this discussion with clients across the country. And, you know, I think someone told me the other day, like housing, housing inventory valuations in California increased 20, like, what was it like 25% just in one year or something like that. It's, it's ridiculous, right? It, it used to be a, a slow creep and then all of a sudden just, right. So it's too much. And so we have to ask ourselves, what's causing this? And I think that, you know, we're, I think it's a combination of what's causing it right now is minimal demand, uh, minimal supply, you know, massive demand, minimal supply. The demand is being pushed by higher mortgage, uh, lower mortgage rates, right? We have, I mean, right now we're looking at what, I mean, even, even with the recent spike a little bit, we're looking at threes, right? I mean, you know, when I, when I first started looking at houses, mortgage rates were in the sevens and eights. My parents always joke about how they, how they were paying, you know, 15% interest in that. That was a killer deal back in the eighties. Right. So it's a, it's a cycle like anything else. Um, but I definitely think that, you know, we've got a lot, we've got way too much. We got over the, the, the demand side is just too high and rates are so low. So um, I don't think it's, it's like, you know, back in 07, you know, you know pre recession where just anyone could buy a, buy a house. Um, but I think there's enough wealth out there where people are buying up homes, even though they're inflated in value because money is so cheap. So we really have to think about that as well. So I think in the long run, it'll balance out, but you know, that it is, it is a serious concern. Um, but one of the things that's a real challenge across the United States is we have massive aging inventory across the country and, and no one wants to buy you know, a 1950s home that hasn't been touched and it has like, you know, you know damaged fixtures and perhaps, some, you know, needs a new roof or, you know, may have, may have some really, you know, landscape problems, whatever you want to call it, right? So that's where, that's where the flipping industry really has served a great amount of value. And I just don't, I just don't see why it's not being appreciated more, you know? And so uh, I think it will eventually once they start to realize, you know, um, once, once, once things kind of balance out, but I, I, I definitely think that that needs to be promoted more and appreciated more. So. Sure. Thank you, Kevin. And, and I know that you kind of touched on it earlier. You kind of, you know, talked about how maybe your parents would have joked they'd pay 14, 15%. Yeah. Um, in the near future, you know, what do you think will happen, you know, when interest rate or if they do, or when they do. Yeah. They Crystal all time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. I don't, it's hard to tell. It's, it's different, right? We, we haven't had this type of, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an economist, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't claim to be, I'm an attorney, right? But you know, we haven't had this type of manipulation in a, a Fed rate in a long time, forced, forced low rates. And the Fed is continuing, Powell spoke yesterday, he doesn't seem to want, he, he kept saying, we're going to keep things status quo for some time. So unless, you know, I mean, unless T-bills all, all of a sudden out, perform, which I don't see them really just, you know, going gangbusters, you know, I don't necessarily think we're going to see skyrocketing mortgage rates anytime soon. I think even if they were going to go up, I think we're probably, you know, conservative, you know, 4%, 5%. When I bought my first home, it was 5%, right? So it's like, 
you know, I, I don't think we're going to see anything that's dramatically increased, but I think it'll be compared compared to now. Right? If you're, you're getting, you know, I think right now pricing is at around what three, two and three quarters, right? So if you're doing five compared to this, it's considerably higher, right? But even when it was in the fives and the fours, we had an inventory problem. So that's another question, right? We have to figure that out. So I don't, I mean, I think as, as long as inventory is in short supply, I think rates are going to stay competitive. Um, I think we really need to think about um, long-term what that means. And I don't necessarily believe in raising rates to an impossible you know, percentage. I don't know the economic impact of that, but I would not want to be back at 8%, 9%, 10% from a um, conventional rate mortgage rate standpoint. Um, so the solution really is to provide more inventory, right? So um, I think that, you know, one of, the new, one of the new developments recently with all this migration, you know, you're in Texas, a lot of, you know, California's in Texas, but it's not just that. If people are moving to Tennessee, people are moving to Idaho, people are moving to Arizona, Texas, Pennsylvania. So maybe this will kind of create more, more need to have more uh, well-spread out inventory. Who knows, right? So I'm hoping it does. So. Sure thing. I, I guess only time will tell, right? We'll see. We'll have to see. I mean, if, if, if Goldman Sachs moves its entire alternatives desk to Dallas, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more houses being built in Dallas, right? So, you know. Yep. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, Kevin. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, as well, you know, maybe a, a bit more about what you do specifically, you know, maybe if someone is looking to, um, they need some sort of legal advice pertaining to real estate, um, yeah. maybe, maybe they just formed their LLC. Maybe they need help yeah. even starting an LLC. You know, yeah. at, at what time would, would it be good to consult with an attorney like yourself? Yeah, typically speaking for us, it's it's when a sponsor is now, is usually either, you know, they're, they're facing capital constraints with their own sources, whether it be their own capital or a line of credit or something like that. And they start to realize, okay, well, I probably need to start working with investors, raising money from investors, right? And so- that's when I usually come in. So the client will usually have um, started their, you know, their core operations. If they're a lender, they're like, you know, this is the usual story, right? They'll they'll have their LLC or the corporation set up, and they may be an investor working with a local broker, and they've done a few loans, and they want to start expanding, right? That's when we start coming in and where we can help them. Um, and then for a lot of clients who've kind of done it for a little while and want to start raising money in series and in a much more serious fashion. You know, maybe raise a fund. You know, my day to day is pretty much doing a lot of advisory when it comes to raising capital, in many shapes and forms. But primarily surrounding, you know, either a fund, uh, some type of you know investor note program or crowdfunding, right? And those kinds of areas where where my expertise lies. Um, and so, whether it be in real estate or in finance, right? So, you know, our clients are, you know, if they're if they're a builder, you know, there are a lot of times they already have a plan. They want to do. They want to do a syndication, or they want to do a GP co-invest fund. They want to start exploring these ideas. That's where we come in, um, and we can really, you know, help them through that. We do a lot of entity formation, but you know, we don't. I mean, I tell I tell clients, listen, if you just need an LLC, just go on the legal. I'm, I'm not I'm not here to set up an LLC for you. I'm here to advise you to structure your business for an ongoing concern. And so, that, typically speaking, we're we're usually you know doing that as part of a, a project, right? So. If you're a lender, you know, we're typically doing some type of capital structure, portfolio structure for you, where you're going to go out there and raise money from investors. Um, you know, a, a lot of times the lenders will say, well, hey, I need to start selling my loans to Wall Street. Can you help me out with that? We'll help them out with that. Um, you know, whether it negotiate the, 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 the uh, sale contracts or, or make sure that their entity structured properly to be compliant. Um, if you're a builder, if you're a real estate developer or an investor, then a lot of times, it's, hey, I've got this project under contract. I want to raise money for it. This is my strategy. You know, can, can you help me achieve that? Right. So that's where that's where we usually come in. Um, and then also, like you know, of course, all sizes, right? So it doesn't really matter. You know, if you're a new market entry, we're really, really responsive and good at holding your hand through the process. But if you're a seasoned professional and you just need docs ready, you know, we can do that for you as well. Um, but, you know, my, my primary bread and butter, like every day, I'm, I'm basically talking to private lenders across the country, you know, existing clients, new, new prospective clients about structuring some kind of capital formation vehicle. Sure thing. Yeah, absolutely. That, that was a, a great uh, synopsis of, of what you do and services you can offer. Um, I'm curious as well, you know, because you talk about raising capital and, you know, I guess if you don't have the money, there, there's nothing, nothing else 
matters, right? So or, I mean, that's true. Yeah, you need to be able to raise some money. Yeah, or find find a source that has the capital, right? So, right. No, exactly, Kevin. Uh, I'm curious. Could you kind of maybe explain the distinction between um, maybe just a normal fund versus uh, crowdfunding? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So when I use the word fund, right? The idea of a fund is really, I mean, there's all types of funds, right? There's hedge funds, private equity funds, VC funds, you know, TP coin, vast funds. But the idea of a fund ultimately boils down to the concept of equity, right? It's, it's, we're creating some kind of LP, LLC, corporation, whatever it is, but the investors are purchasing ownership interest in that entity, right? And that entity will go out there and invest in assets and pool them, right? So in the real estate or, or private, private lending context, the mortgage fund, right, the debt fund, the investors are purchasing membership interest in the LLC or LP interest in the LLC. And that LLC is going to originate and fund and hold mortgages, right? That's a fund. Crowdfunding is not a structure. Crowdfunding is a methodology in which you raise capital for a investment vehicle, right? So if you're doing a fund and you want to crowdfund your fund, right? You can pursue a crowdfunding regulation like regulation A and sell this to the general public. Right at a lower, you know, entry, um, a lower entry hurdle to entry, right? A thousand dollar investment as, a, as compared to a normal debt fund that's right, where that's focused on high net worth investors. The minimum investment is going to be, you know, twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars, right? So that's what I mean by crowdfunding, right? And so crowdfunding can be used in real estate and in, and in, in private lending to fund your your fund, right? To raise capital for your fund from the masses. Right, and that's what crowdfunding truly is. It's a methodology in which you are raising money from the crowd, right? And the real issue is, is, is that once we start talking about the crowd, we're talking about everybody, right? And we're talking about non-accredited investors, right? And these are the ones that the SEC cares about. You know, I said Joe Sixpack, you know, regular old investor who is not high net worth, and that ten thousand dollar investor is a lot of money to him. Right, and we care about that. The SEC cares about that. And they want to regulate that. So that's why the crowdfunding regulations are much more intrusive and much more, uh, uh, much more har uh, harder to obtain, as opposed to Regulation D that focuses on high net worth accredited investors. We don't have to file for anything. I mean, we do have to file for them. We don't have to get approved by the SEC. So you know, if I'm doing crowdfunding, I have to ask the client, "What do you mean by this?" Right? You know, typically, client will come to me and say, "Hey, Kevin, I want to do crowdfunding." Okay, well, what do you mean by that? Right? Is it do you want to raise money online, right? But via a high net worth investors, right? That's not really crowdfunding, right? Because that's just, that's not the crowd, right? So that, that's one of the differences. I, I make a lot of enemies with, with this statement, but like I raise a lot of eyebrows with the statement because there's a lot of crowdfunding operations out there, but they're limited to accredited investors only. And they happen to have their offering done online, right? That's different, right? That's different. And basically you just, you have an online offering, right? You have, my investors are high net worth investors. They can, look at this investment opportunity online. True crowdfunding requires that we're raising money from anybody, you know, not accredited investors, accredited investors, it's fine, right? And so, you know, typically speaking, if you're doing that, you're relying either on Reg CF, Regulation A, um, so local regulations that are crowdfunding exemptions at the local level. And so the, those, that's what defines crowdfunding, right? And so, um, you know, it can be debt, it can be equity, it can be a fund, it can be a bond program, it can be uh, secured notes, it can be a securitization, it can be all types of investment structures that are not a fund, right? The key is how you're raising money. Okay, we're doing it via crowdfunding, right? Sure thing. Now, that, that was a, a great synopsis as well as kind of, kind of the difference because it, it kind of seems like people are wanting to maybe know a bit more about what these terms are because it yeah. almost kind of seems like crowdfunding has kind of become the new hot buzzword, right? It was it was for a very long time. Now, I think now <laughs> cryptocurrency is now the, now the big buzzword. <laughs> uh, blockchain and crypto and, 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 yeah. and Dogecoin and all these kind of things. And I'm all for it. Listen, there's ways to do it, but you, have to, you, know, you can't cut corners and you got to make sure you follow the law, you know, because the SEC is watching, right? Um, but crowdfunding is one of those things. A lot of people think that crowdfunding is like the answer, right? But if you look at the, if you look at the marketplace, right, you know, some of the largest and most successful crowdfunders have a very, very large operation, right? They have a very large staff that's typically funded by some type of series A round, you know, VC round or hedge fund, you know, angel investor, whatever it is to fund their operations. And the crowdfunding component is used to 
fund the actual transaction for in real estate, right? Fund the actual transactions. You have to ask yourself, you know, do I have the resources and infrastructure to support this? Because, you know, if we go to a Reg A, it's a pretty significant lift, you know, compared to a Reg B. Um, and frankly, I don't know about you, but I would rather not deal. I would rather not have to manage, you know, a thousand, five thousand dollar investors. I would rather deal with, you know, maybe ten, five hundred thousand dollar investors, or five million dollar <laughs> investors, right? So that's why you still see a major trend with, you know, non crowdfunding type funds and, and capital structures uh, in both real estate and in private lending, right? So whether it be trusted investing, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending, mortgage funds, or, you know, institutional loan sales, so. Sure thing, no, you, you drew a pretty good parallel there. Um, it almost kind of reminds me of someone who would prefer to have, um, you know, instead of having uh, 100 um, single family homes, they'd rather just have an apartment complex with, you know, that's 100 units, right? Right, right. I mean, there's the level of volume of work that you have to do, right? And sure, there are providers out there for that. And but just know that it comes with a cost and, and, you know, that eats into your margins, you know, so. Sure, absolutely, Kevin. Um, well, you know, is there anything that you haven't said that you'd really just like to hit home? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, listen, listen this, we, I've done a few of these now. And, you know, I think one of the questions that we usually get is, you know, you know who we are. And like, I would have told you guys, you know, who we are and, you know, essentially, we'd love to meet new private lenders across the country. We are always working to work, you know, working to teach private lenders their business, the business. Um, so I don't know about your listeners, but if they're in the, in the lending industry or they're new investors, uh, just pay attention, you know, sign up for our, our, you know, newsletters and stuff like that. We've got some great content for uh, your listeners out there. And uh, we do our own events. So one thing we also do is we provide a lot of value to the industry beyond legal services. And so... Uh, we have a, a conference coming up. We throw we have two conferences every year for the private lending industry. So we've got one coming up in April. It's called Innovate. It's going to be in Newport Beach. And yes, there will be social distancing. And yes, there will be masks and all that fun stuff. But uh, we feel that networking is you know paramount in this industry. So uh, it's a value that we try to provide our clients. So we hope to uh, we invite your listeners to join us and. Uh, I think it'll be in, in April. You can go on our website, JurassicCon.com or Jurassi llp.com and link to that as well. Um, and yeah, if, if you're a new private lender or a seasoned private lender, please sign up for our, our, uh, our website newsletter. We put out a lot of legal, uh, good advice and best practices to the industry. So um, making sure that we provide a lot of value that way. So just uh, want to put that out there for your listeners. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and, you know, maybe someone's listening, whether they're a private lender, a developer, builder, investor, whoever it may be, um, you know, maybe they you know, found what, what you had to talk about today to be, to be pretty good and pretty profound. You know, how, how can we get a hold of you? Where, where can we find you? Yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, email is probably the best way. You can find me on our, on our website, jurassiellp.com. Um, you can find, you can email me, uh, email is k.kim at jurassiellp.com. I should have it here, but I don't. Um, and then also, uh, you can also, you know, we have, we're all over, you know, socials and the web and LinkedIn and, we obsess about that kind of stuff. So I'm sure if you're in the private lending industry and you haven't heard about us, all you have to do is Google me and uh, private lending and you'll find me. So um, yeah, and please uh, make sure to, to, to join us on our newsletter and even uh, uh, you know our, our uh, YouTube channel and all that fun stuff. So a lot of good content out there from that perspective. But yeah, best way to reach me is by email. So that's k.kim at jerasiellp.com. You can also reach me by phone, 949-535-1439. That's my direct line. It goes to my cell, so call me, text me, whatever you want. And uh, yeah, always happy to help new lenders out and get them started or help out a seasoned lender or just uh, make some introductions. So. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. You know, it's uh, it, we've covered a lot of ground here. We've talked a bit you know, about you, the markets you serve in, you know, really all over the country. Um, some great explanations about, you know, funds, crowdfunding, um, different, you know, kind of the, the scope of work that you're looking at in terms of, you know, services you can offer. Um, so uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Happy to do it. All righty. We'll, we'll talk to you soon, Kevin. All right. Take care. Thank you very much for having me on today.